Hello, welcome back. It's Pastor Rob Lee, lead pastor for our Guardian of Valley Assembly. Thank you so much for joining us on another one of our eschatological, eschatological studies. And today we're going to be doing a study on what I've entitled an Exodus rapture, the joy of the church. And this is a comparison to the impact that um, Egypt had, Egypt suffered, when the Israelites left Egypt on the night of the Passover. I believe there's a lot of similarities between that event and the soon coming rapture of the church. That's what we're going to cover on this episode. So uh, the question I want to begin is, have you ever wondered what, a, what, what happened to Egypt after the children of Israel left it in just one night? Uh, we often place our focus on the Israelites as they journeyed to the promised land. But what about the Egyptians? You know, in this study, we're going to take a closer look at the startling parallels of impact the nation of Egypt had after the Israelites left and what the world will endure after the church is raptured. Let's begin. So you have to get your Bibles, and we're doing a little Bible study here, so have your Bible. i got my Bible right here, so open it up to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Okay, now we're talking about the Passover night in Egypt, okay? So go to verse 29 of Exodus chapter 12. Let's read together. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. By the way, I'm reading from the New King James Version, okay? So we see here in this one passage that the angel of the Lord came through and took out the firstborn of everybody that did not have the uh, blood atoned on the doorposts and lintel of their dwellings. Um, this was the final judgment of God. This was the 10th plague that was placed upon the Egyptians and it affected everyone in Egypt. So the death of the firstborn of every family in the land whose doorposts were not covered by the blood of a lamb. Now the Passover, um, you should know, is an, a messianic foretelling of the future Christ and him becoming the perfect sacrifice and atoning sacrifice for sin on a future cross at Calvary. So, put it another way, if you want to make the rapture, you had better be saved and walking in a right relationship with the Lord when he returns. Because whether you're ready or not, Jesus is coming for his church. And that's a church that's watching and waiting for him. Now listen folks, I don't want to split hairs. I got very few to split. But I'll tell you that there are some people out there that teach if you don't believe in a pre-trib rapture and if you're not watching for Jesus, he's not coming for you. Now that's preacher rhetoric. Okay, the bottom line is, is if you love Jesus, he's coming for you. If you don't believe the rapture is going to happen for 100 years, he's coming for you. He loves you. And if you love him and your relationship with him, that's all it takes to be raptured. So try not to get caught up with some of these things that people say on the internet, these preachers that they get a little caught up in their own rhetoric. I want to encourage you with that. Hey, let's go to Luke chapter 21. In your Bibles, Luke 21, verses 34 and following. Jesus, of course, is talking and he says this. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down by carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore, and pray always, that you may be counted worthy to escape. That's the rapture. All these things that will come to pass, that's the tribulation, and to stand before the Son of Man. That's the Bema Seat judgment. So God's judgment on this side of the veil will affect the entire world. First for the church, who has been covered by the blood of Jesus because... His judgment always begins in his house. Then the world at large will experience God's global judgment in a post-rapture seven-year tribulation period. And that's what's going to take place. Now, you should know that on the same night of Passover, after the angel of de death struck Egypt, that same night, this is what happened. Let's continue reading in Exodus 12, verse 31. Then Pharaoh, it says, then he, referring to Pharaoh, called for Moses and Aaron by night, which means that night, 
and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. And also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. See, this command from Pharaoh to Moses and Aaron was the approval that they were looking for in the first place, to be released from the bondage of Egypt and to be allowed to return to the promised land. The term by night meant that very night Israel was released. This is Passover now. So how like the church today who are waiting to be released from the bondage of this world via death or rapture from the uh, oppression um, of its uh, leader, the devil himself. And so we're looking for that. Uh, let's pick it up. Verse 33. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people, referring to the Hebrews, took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so they had granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians." So the picture here is that all the Egyptians who had been suffering under the ten judgments of God, um, who were also afraid for their very lives because of the Hebrews, they urged them to send them out of the land in haste, which is a type and a shadow of a future rapture of the church being sent out of this world in haste. The message here is that the rapture will be instant. Now Moses had directed the Israelites to ask the Egyptians for silver, gold and articles of clothing, and the Egyptians gave it to them to their own financial ruin, literally. They had what they had, they gave it to the Egyptians. They were ruined financially. They just wanted to get rid of these people. We have heard a lot of talk about the economy and its pending collapse. Uh, my theory that as long as the Spirit-filled church is on the earth, the restraining force of the Spirit continues to hold back evil, including global, global economic devastation. And I believe that the same way that the Hebrews plundered the Egyptians in the Exodus account, so the church's absence at the rapture will plunder global markets. The Hebrews and Egyptians are Old Testament prototypes of the New Testament church and the world. And when we're gone, this planet will suffer a fate akin to Egypt when the Israelites left. That's the premise of today's topic. Now, the idea of the Hebrews putting their dough in their clothes before it was leavened and carrying it on their shoulders speaks to their immediate departure. It happened that night. And this is the origin of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the second of the spring feasts of Israel. This feast speaks of Christ's future death on a cross, which spares believers uh, from the consequences of their sin, which is eternal death. So Israel leaving Egypt that night is akin to a sinner being freed from the bondage of their sin and experienced in salvation through Jesus' shed blood. History would prove that after the Hebrews left Egypt, that nation never rose to her former glory. In fact, it continued to degrade. Today, tourism is a major trade for Egypt as people from all over the world will go there to look at relics and statues and the pyramids and, you know, the, the Valley of the Gods and other evidences of an ancient Hebrew influence. And this is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen to this world when all the Christians are instantly removed from their places of financial responsibility, positions of power and influence, not to mention all children and toddlers and babies and watch this, even the unborn are going to disappear from their mother's womb. There will not be a soul, children, no children on the planet for a minimum of nine months. Anytime a king goes to war with another nation, children often suffer as a result of the invasion. But this king, the king of kings, the lord of lords, is going to go to war with the earth. And this is the one time that no children whatsoever will suffer as a result of this invasion. It's going to be great. Born-again Christians have always been blessed of the Lord and have prospered comparatively with the majority of the unsaved world. There have been studies done that, serve, uh, that reveal that in, that in general and on average, Christians live longer, they're happier, and have more wealth and better jobs than a non-believer. And the reason is because God Almighty is, is blessing them. His blessing is upon them. You know, uh, the prophet Isaiah uh, spoke of this. 
If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 33, and we'll pick it up at verse 17. Okay? Um, your eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. Your heart will meditate on terror. Where is the scribe? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? You will not see a fierce people, a people of obscure speech beyond perception of a stammering tongue that you cannot understand. Look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet home, a tabernacle that will not be taken down. Not one of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. So here the prophet is speaking of a future event where a future people, and that is we believe to be the church, will see the king. And the king, of course, is Jesus. And they'll see him, how are they going to see him? In his beauty. His beauty is his glorified state. And the land that is a very far off, well, that's heaven, okay? And then in verse 18, Isaiah describes what the people who are left behind are going to feel. They're going to feel terror. Now, these are questions those who are left behind will be asking when the rapture happens. Where is the scribe? Where is he who weighs? And, and where is he who counts the towers? See, the prophet is describing a diverse people of industry who have instantly vanished from the earth. These are key people who God has blessed and who were in positions of leadership and importance for the continuance of commerce and national safety. Some of these people uh, who have been raptured are a fierce people of obscure speech beyond perception and of a stammering tongue that you cannot understand, unquote. Many scholars believe, including myself, that these are spirit-filled Christians who speak in tongues. Even though not all Christians speak in tongues, they are all filled with the Spirit of God because God's Holy Spirit is in them and His Holy Spirit is the one who regenerates our spirit at salvation. So you've got key people in commerce, who are filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues, and they're gone, baby. They're out of here. That's what he's describing from a certain point of view. There will be people that will read that and say, I don't know if I see that. But the more you study it, the more you realize that's probably a greater truth. Isaiah goes on to say in verse 20, he says this, Look upon Zion. Now Zion, of course, is Jerusalem. The city of our appointed feasts. The appointed feasts of the seven feasts of the Lord. Leviticus 23. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet home, a tabernacle that will not be taken down. Now that's the, th the third future temple, the, the, the future third temple. It's not been built yet, but it, it will be. Not one of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. Now at the time that Isaiah wrote this, there was a temple in Jerusalem. But this speaks of another temple yet to be built again, and it will never, ever be destroyed. Some people say, well, what about, what about Ezekiel's temple during the millennial reign of Christ? And what I tell people is, what we're going to see is a major room addition on the third temple, what we call the tribulation temple, because Ezekiel's temple is much larger, but it expands out, you know, over a mile squared, over the entire um, uh, area. They're going to level it out. And so that's uh, uh, another session for another time. But, but, you, but you understand that during the millennial reign, we'll have a very large temple and it needs to be large because three times a year during the feasts of Passover and Pentecost and Sukkot, all the men have to go to Jerusalem and celebrate those feasts. And uh, I have another teaching on that, how they get there and what that looks like. So this temple, when it's built, is going to stay there. Now you should know that God has always provided for his people, in many cases to the abundance, because he is true to his word. When he removes the church and their blessings from the earth at the rapture, the people who are left behind are going to fill the vacuum, just like the people of Egypt did in the Exodus account. You need to know that when those people were gone, they're looking around saying, where is all the workers? Where is he who counts the towers? Where's the guy that's going to build that pyramid or is going to polish that, that, uh, you know, that idol or whatever the case may be? Let's, uh, let's pick it up in Exodus chapter 12, and let's pick it up at verse 37. Well, then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. A mixed multitude went up with them also in flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock. And they baked unleavened cakes of dough, which they had brought out of Egypt. 
for it was not leavened because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. In other words, they were like, get your stuff and get out. You're, you're leaving tonight. And that's exactly what happened on the Passover night. So we see here that about 600,000 men plus women and children are being moved in one night. This is where many Bible scholars arrive at a number close to 3 million people. It's quite an exodus. Think of the impact to commerce, to national economics, to the labor force and resources now drastically diminished as a result of the exodus. Listen, folks, no nation could survive such a large and instantaneous walkout of its productive labor force, its commerce stimulant, and its social stability. And you need to know that by the time we get to the 10th plague, we've had nine other plagues that have already weakened the Egyptian economy and the people. Now, right now we're in a COVID crisis right now, COVID-19 crisis, and now we're having riots on the streets. So what we have here is we have a nation that's weakened, and there are powers in play right now that want to destroy it. So while it's weak, they're trying to continue to, to make it weaker. We see similarities here, and I want you to see these similarities as well, which is why I'm producing this video. Uh, the coronavirus, as you know, has weakened America and the economics of our world. Uh, in our weakened state, we can't take any more hits without fully imploding. And this is where Egypt was when the Israelites left. Uh, they were in a weakened state already, and then they lost their labor force. Now, just today, President Trump announced that he's uh, stabilizing our police forces. He's not going to allow any cities to defund any police departments. Some people say he doesn't have the authority to do that. But here's the truth. President Trump can say, I have the authority, and I'll prove it to you. You'll get no federal funding from us if you don't do what I say. You're not defunding those police departments. That is ludicrous. You get rid of the cops and you're going to have national chaos. That's just the way that works. So we got a law and order president who's standing square in his shoulders against the opposition because the opposition is evil. It's very evil and they have an evil agenda. But our president has God's agenda. I believe him to be a born again Christian. He may not have started out that way, but with all these people praying for him, I believe the man is, is walking right with the Lord and I believe he'll be gone in the rapture. That's how serious I am. You want to do a little research on his background. Google the Hebrids revival of Scotland at the turn of the century. It's in your uh, Google search engine. Just put that in there. You'll get a bunch of stuff and some teachings on what happened when he was a little boy at the Hebrids revival with his, with his parents and his grandparents. And how the Lord had appointed him from a long time ago to be our president for such a time as this. I personally believe he will be the president at the rapture of the church. That's how, that's how I feel. And I believe that we are on the precipice. We're right there at the rapture. Yet I'm planning long term. I've got my life insurance out till I'm 75 years old. I'm 55 right now. Why would I do that? Because while I believe that Jesus Christ is coming back tomorrow, I also am planning for him not to come back for another, well, till the rest of my life if possible. It's weird to live like that. But we've got to look long term and short term. That's how we live as believers. It's called living by faith. And that's what we're doing. I want to encourage you to do the same. Okay, let's, um, let's pick up our study. Exodus chapter 14 now. We're going to go ahead a couple of chapters. And let's pick it up at verse 5. Now Pharaoh was reasoning with himself. He started to think, wait a minute, what did I just do? I just got rid of all of our laborers here. How am I going to fix this? So the Bible says in Exodus 14 and verse 5, Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, referring to the Jews. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So the parallel for a modern rapture picture is that those people who are left behind are going to miss us, because they're going to feel firsthand the lack of blessing on the world because we're no longer here. See, right now they don't like us. These left-wingers, they hate these right-wing Christians. They think we're fanatics. They think we're just in the way. And for the most part, we are in the way. They have an agenda, and we're stopping their agenda. So when we're gone, they're going to think, oh, yeah, now we can do our agenda. But they're going to realize when we go, the blessing of God goes with us. The protection of God goes with us. The restraining force of the Holy Spirit spoken of in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 goes with us. Listen, the world hates us because they hate the Jesus who is in us. That's just the way it is. You know, the Lord spoke of this in John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. He said, If the world hates you, and by the way, it does, uh, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Verse 19 says, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. 
But because you are yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's why we don't get along with people in certain communities who oppose us and oppose what we believe, because light has no fellowship with darkness. Paul said that, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. So you get the idea. Now listen, as Christians, we're persecuted, we're discriminated against in the media, the, the workplace, in our national laws, even in the culture at large. It's easy to take a pot shot at a believer because of our conservative and fundamental beliefs. We seem to be like punching bags of persecution. I mean, the things that are done to Christians, you would never do to a Muslim. No way. It would never happen. But they do it to Christians. They feel like we're easy shots. Now, I want you to know, I'm a big dude. I'm 6'2 and probably a little heavier than I should be, but I take care of my own. And I want you to know that in our church, Gardena Valley Assembly, we teach our people to walk tall, but to carry, uh, uh, be humble as we, we carry on with the things of the Lord. And I want to encourage you, you don't have to be a doormat to be a Christian. We're called to be humble, but we're also called to defend our faith. So I encourage you with that. See, people don't, or I should say, people who persecute us don't even know that it's because of the Christ that is within us that the blessing of the Lord is upon us and his restraining power of evil is still on the earth. That's just a fact. They don't know it, but it's unfortunate, but true. You know, Jesus goes on to say, if you have your Bibles in John 15, read on from 20 and following. He says, remember that the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, well, they're going to persecute you. If they kept my word, well, they will keep yours as well. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, thinking they persecute you for me. That's really what he says. Because they do not know him, referring to God, who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have, they would have no sin. In other words, they would have not known of their sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. And, of course, this is addressing the Jews. And if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no, they would have no sin. Again, not known of their sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my Father. But this happened that the, world might be, the word might be fulfilled, which was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Now, the target here in John 15 is the Jewish people. So if you're Jewish and you're watching this and you don't know Jesus as your true Messiah, you need to know Jesus is the true Messiah. See, all the, uh, all the world's complaining of our conservative ways and their persecution of us and their harsh comments, the gossip, the slander uh, about us, that's all going to come to an end. You see, we love Jesus. And our love for the Lord and our willingness to conform to the world's wicked ways is going to bite them so hard that they, like the Egyptians of old, are going to want us back. Because although they may have hated us, they love the blessing of the Lord that comes with us. And so it is with the American culture. Let me tell you something. There are many nations in the world who hate America, but they love the American dollar. There is something about God's blessing that attracts people who hate God. The picture that's being presented here is one where the Israelites did not even pack their provisions. They just left in haste on one night, the very night of the Passover. That's the picture. Let's pick it up in verse uh, 40 and following. Now the sojourn, and you should be in Exodus 14, Exodus 14, 40. Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years on that very same day. On that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. Said it again. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout all their generations. So God never does anything randomly. There's always a deeper meaning and purpose behind everything that he does. The Hebrews were in the bondage of Egypt for 430 years to the day. When the Israelites were taken captive by the Babylonians, they were in bondage for 70 years. And then the Lord said, it's time to go. I mean, God does everything with precision here. 
It is believed by many Bible prophecy scholars that the Moed, or appointed time, of each of the seven feasts of the Lord speak to specific events in history and in prophecy where God has done something in the past or is going to do something in the future. So let's take the seven feasts of the Lord. They speak to this. The first four feasts occur during the spring and have already occurred in history. The final three feasts occur in the fall, and many Christians believe they are just about to occur. The very first feast is Passover, which is what we're talking about right now in this study. This first Passover occurred in Egypt. That's solid history. It's occurred in the past. And the type and the shadow of Passover for the Christians is Christ's crucifixion. He came to the earth to die for the sins of the world. Uh, that's where we see the blood applied to the doorposts and the lintel. It's a form of a cross. So in the future, we see Jesus dying on the cross. And then we have unleavened bread. That's... Uh, Christ being buried in the borrowed tomb for three days. The bread was without sin, unleavened, without yeast, because they didn't have a chance to put anything in. They had to go that night. They just grabbed their dough, and they were gone, baby, in one night. And that's what happened. Again, a picture of, of Christ being buried. Then we have the Feast of first fruits, which is the what we would call Easter, the resurrection. This is Christ rising from the dead, conquering death, hell, and the grave. And then we have the Feast of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit is given. This is the birth of the church and the, the, the church age. Then we go into the fall, where we have the Feast of Trumpets. That's the rapture of the church, or if you believe in a Pentecostal rapture, it would be the signing of the peace treaty. Some people believe in Pentecostal rapture, so the rapture is in Pentecost, so the signing of the peace treaty takes place in, in, um, at, the, at the trumpets. So it could go either way. We don't know, but you just plug in where it works. Then you have Yom Kippur, that's the Day of Atonement, the Day of Blood, that's your seven-year tribulation, and that culminates with the Christ's second coming. And then you have Tabernacles, which talks about the, the uh, global millennial reign. The Tabernacles could be the second coming of Jesus, and then his millennial reign, but the Tabernacles really is the millennial reign. So it, some people put the second coming at the end of Atonement, some people put the second coming at, 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 as with Tabernacles, and coupled with the millennial reign. It really doesn't matter. What matters is you get the order right. Uh, the final judgment from God upon Egypt was the death of the firstborn of any home that wasn't atoned for with lamb's blood on the doorposts and lintel according to God's command. This was the first Passover with a messianic foretelling of what Jesus would later do on a cross for the sins of the world. Now listen folks, any person who does not have their sin atoned for by Jesus' blood that was shed on a cross is going to be judged by Jesus um, at the great white throne judgment. Because the people of Egypt were pagan, they did not atone their home from the coming judgment. And as a result, they paid the price of losing their firstborn son. Well, so it is with so many families today. They may know of God, but they don't have a relationship with God. So they raise their children to believe their way, and their children raise their children in the same way, and so on and so on. So you create this multi-generational uh, pagan thinking that, is, that does not include God in anything. And what you're going to end up with is a generational curse that only Jesus Christ himself can break if he is allowed to do so. This is basically the gospel message of the cross. But everybody has to choose for themselves. I want to remind people of commandment number three. You can read about this in Exodus chapter 20. No graven images, no idols, uh, or any distraction that comes between you and the Lord. Exodus 20 verses 5 and 6. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, or worship them, depending on what your translation is. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Jealous is zealous. He's zealous for our love. He's not willing to share us with other people or other things. That's what he's saying visiting or punishing the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and who keep my commandments. So here we can see the formula of how so many families are lulled into a false sense of spiritual security when it comes to understanding their faith in God and how to truly be saved by grace through faith in Jesus. Some people think, well, I'm a good person. Being good is good enough. God would never send a good person to hell. Listen, people go to hell every day and they're good people. That's just the bottom line. Gandhi, if he didn't accept Christ at the end of his life, 
is going to hell. That's just the way it works. In other words, people go to hell because their, their sins aren't atoned for by Jesus. In other words, you could be a good person and still go to hell. You can be a bad person and still go to hell. The point is, you have to have Jesus in your life. You have to ask him to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from your unrighteousness. You have to be born again of the Spirit of God. That's just the way it works. You know, we all know the story of how God miraculously delivered the children of Israel from the clutches of the pursuing Egyptians by opening up the Red Sea and providing dry land for them to walk on while crushing the Egyptians in the sea. We've read that. When the Israelites saw that their deliverance was secure, Exodus chapter 15 records how Israel worshiped the Lord on the shores of the Red Sea. Let's go there, Exodus 15. Let's pick it up at verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You in your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. You see, it's, it's God's mercy that he leads his people forward to those he has redeemed. And where does God lead us? He leads us to his holy habitation. And where's that? That's heaven. See, if we love Jesus and we've invited him to be the Lord of our life, we're going to go to heaven in the rapture. That's God's holy habitation. But what of the people who are left behind? That's what I'm talking about in this particular episode. Listen, Exodus 15, verses 14 and following. The Bible says, The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistine. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will, will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as a stone till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom you have purchased. This is Exodus chapter 15, verses 14 through 16. It gives us descriptors like sorrow, dismay, trembling, melt away, fear, and dread. These are all words used here in this passage to describe what the Egyptians felt as the Israelites were supernaturally delivered, not only from Egypt, but through the Red Sea. See, Pharaoh's army was still as a stone while God's people passed over to the safety of the other side. The Bible says that the glory of the Lord stood between the forward positions of the Egyptian army and he was the rear guard of the Israelites as they passed through. In other words, God froze, God froze the Egyptian army in place until the Israelites were safely through and to the other side of the Red Sea. Can you imagine what that would have been like? What a picture that would have been. God's people need to know that the Lord will deliver us from the judgment to come, and from the enemy who was set out to destroy us. We need to have this assurity because it, it's how the Lord works. He takes care of his own. He just does. Listen, you can have faith in God. He'll take care of you. So here's the question. What is it that God will do with us? Where will he take us? Exodus 15, verse 17. Watch this. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. In the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. In other words, God has prepared a place for us, a place for his people, a place for his church, a place for his bride. The Lord will reign forever, and we're going to reign with him. Let's pick it up at verse 18 and 19 of Exodus 15. The Lord shall reign forever and ever, for the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and his horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. A lot of people don't believe this even happened. But I'm going to tell you something. You can Google the Gulf of Aqaba, the Red Sea crossing in the Gulf of Aqaba. Today, there are two weathered obelisks on one side and on the other side. And a guy in 1985 by the name of Ron Wyatt, Ron Wyatt, archaeological research. You can go to his website. This is a fact. And he's passed on now. But he sent a crew down into the water. Some of them were his sons. And they had video equipment. And they actually found that there was a land bridge in the water that was just 100 feet 
below the surface of the water and then it dropped on both sides to a thousand feet. And on that land bridge, you have encased in coral, you have chariots, horses' bones, you have uh, shields, swords. Um, there's even one wheel that's solid gold. It's the Pharaoh's wheel and no coral is on it. And you can take a picture of it. You could see it, a horse hoof uh, and so forth. This is physical evidence of a Red Sea crossing and the destruction of the Egyptian army. Clear as day. Evidence. You can check it out for yourself, some of you skeptics. Now, the Apostle Paul quoted the Old Testament said it this way. Now, this is 1 Corinthians 2.9. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. This Recap reveals God's delivering power over the oppressive forces of the enemy and also over the laws of nature. God's not limited by gravity or economics or geopolitical crisis. He is God and there's none like him. Let's go to Exodus 14 verses 28 through 30. Uh, Exodus 14 or Exodus 15. I, I might have messed up a little bit on that so just kind of work with me. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots and horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained, but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. You see, God's staying power is God's delivering power. He has given us the same staying power so we can be faithful to the very end and not lose heart. God strengthens us through the Holy Spirit so that when we get weak or tired or fearful in our fight, He is there to remind us that He will see us through. And as believers in Jesus, we must continually sow to the Spirit and not to our flesh. When we sow to the Spirit, the Lord is glorified. But when we sow to the flesh, well, the enemy is glorified. We must be determined to be as holy and righteous as we are pure of heart. And we must allow the conviction of the Spirit to move us to higher places of holiness and faith when we put asunder those fleshly things that tend to hurt our spirit. Galatians 6 verses 8 through 10 say this, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have faith, opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Listen, the Egyptians sowed to the flesh, and they reaped corruption. The Israelites who followed after God sowed to the Spirit, and they reaped everlasting life. Now listen, we're the church, we're the body of Christ, and our commission is to be faithful stewards of our faith, sowing to the Holy Spirit of God. If we do not grow weary while doing well, we will reap a great reward if we do not lose heart. Listen, Jesus spoke of this in the parable of the mina in Luke 19. Luke 19, 11 says this, Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. See, while it's true that believers in Jesus, they thought that he would bring in his kingdom rule at that time, God had another plan. That was verse uh, 11 of Luke 19. Let's go to verse 12. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman, this is Jesus, uh, uh, went to a far country, that would be heaven, to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants and delivered them ten minus, or money. And he said to them, do business, or occupy, if you have the King James Version, it's occupy till I come. Verse 14, but his, but his citizens, that's the world, hated him, and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. These are all your liberals that say, we're not going to church, we're not going to read the Bible, we're not going to believe in God. Verse 15, and so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then the first, then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned me ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. 
because you were faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned me five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also will be over five cities. So what we have here is a reward system that God has set up as a part of his eternal kingdom. And as believers in Jesus, we are going to receive our rewards at the Bema Seed Judgment that are based on how well we did in this life. That's just the way it is. There are people out there that will say everybody gets the same. That's communistic thinking. The kingdom of heaven is capitalistic. In other words, God says, if you do more, you'll get more. If you work harder, I'll bless you. If you trust me and do what I say, you'll have rewards. That's the Bema Seed. And of course, with those places that we fail, we'll lose rewards, but we don't lose our salvation because that was determined at the cross. So, when we return to the earth with Jesus after the seven-year tribulation, some of us will be issued degrees of responsibility where we will co-rule and reign with Jesus as he rules from Jerusalem and oversees the global restoration of a tribulation-torn earth. Our faithfulness here and now will determine who and how much we will co-rule and reign with him there and then. Let's pick it up in verse 20. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. I feared you because you are an austere man. Austere, A-U-S-T-E-R-E. -E. Uh, some people don't know what that word means. It means stern or strict. It says, you collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit or reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at least at my coming I might have collected it with interest? I want to pause here and just say uh, that each of us were, are going to have to give an account for how well we used our talents for the Lord in our lifetime. In other words, the Lord's command for us is to occupy till he returns, to do business till he returns. And that's for all of us. So I'm going to ask you this question, or I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Let's do the quick 10 talent checklist. Okay? How are we using our talents for the Lord? So the first question you want to ask is, am I saved? This is the first and foremost thing we want us to do. We've got to receive Jesus. So if you're not saved, you need to get saved. Okay? The second thing, do I pray? Do I read my Bible? Do I witness? I mean, what does that look like? How, how, how do you uh, show your faith? Number three, do I support my church and my attendance, my ministry, my financial stewardship? You know, do you tithe and, and give to missions? That kind of thing. Number four, am I a supporter of foreign missions and special outreach to my community? In other words, it's not just about me, and it's not just about my church. It's about other people. What am I doing about that? Number five, am I a good steward of the people that God has entrusted to my care, mainly my family? Number six, does my attitude towards others reflect God's love for them, even under duress? My attitude towards others, does it reflect God's love for them even when I'm having a rough day? Number seven, do I allow for a sinful lifestyle to be integrated into my Christian life and thought? Am I one of those guys that have kind of, I'm a Christian, but I have a kind of a secret sin I do on, on the side? How about this? Am I looking for the return of the Lord and the rapture? And am I living accordingly? That's a good question. Number, uh, number nine, have I allowed fear, faithlessness, and despair to hamper my trust in God? And then 10, do I give place for the devil at times as I live out my faith in Jesus? See, if you're not doing as well as some of these as you should be or can be, I encourage you to get with it because in this context, the kingdom of heaven really is at hand. We could all use improvement in our spiritual life formation. We must all be faithful and continue to strive to be more like Jesus, starving our flesh, but feeding our spirit. All right, let's pick it up. Luke uh, 19, verses 11 and following. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him. This is the guy that, that uh, hid it in his handkerchief. And give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. And he says, for I say to you that, to that everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. You see, this passage speaks to the coming judgment of the nations that will commence when Jesus returns to the earth in his second coming. 
those who are found to be faithless enemies of the Lord, that's partakers of the, mark, the, the beast's mark, the mark of the beast, and his new world order agenda, these are the ones that are going to be cast into hell, right at the judgment of the nations. So those who are found to be faithful survivors of the tribulation and who rejected the rule of the Antichrist will be judged accordingly and allowed to enter into Christ's millennial kingdom. Egypt was left vulnerable as her national army was decimated in the Red Sea. Her economic engine, which ran her commerce, was removed in one night as the children of Israel were ordered to leave Egypt, thus crippling her economy. This once great nation that fed the nations of the world, saving them from a global famine under the leadership of Joseph, was itself reduced to a leaderless, armyless, manless land full of death and destruction due to the plagues inflicted upon it by God, never, watch this, never to reclaim her former glory even to this day. When people visit Egypt, they go to look at relics of her ancient past, the Finks, the Spearmids, uh, the Valley of the Gods and such. It's a tourist trap at best, and that's it. And I believe a similar fate awaits America. The same way that ancient Egypt was judged by God, if we continue to falter in our moral, economic, political, and spiritual mandates forged by our founding fathers who were both Christian and patriots, we too are going to suffer. Now listen, God's blessed America, especially recently under President Trump. However, the powers that be are against this modern-day Cyrus. God proposed, uh, God's purpose was to use him to bless this nation and the world through it. But the winds of change are blowing. As long as the church of Jesus Christ is on the earth, we can make a difference. Our presence here invokes the blessing of the Lord within the context of our service and presentation of God's kingdom agenda on earth as it's written in heaven. We have God's word as our guide. His word, God's word, this is God's word as our guide. Our faith in Jesus as our confidence and our hope in his eternal kingdom that awaits us as part of his promise to us. Jesus says it this way in John 14. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. See, after the Red Sea incident, which was God's way of separating the Israelites' path back to Egypt by baptizing them into a new life and into a new hope in Him, we find the Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai where they would receive the Ten Commandments, the basis of the law, from the Lord via Moses, their leader. Let's pick it up. Exodus 19, verses 3 and following. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Let's break that down. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians speaks to God's purpose and destiny for Israel. That is for them not to be in bondage in sin um, or in Egypt or for us in this world. He says, how I bore you on eagle's wings speaks to the careful protection that God has for his people. Listen, an eagle does not carry her young in her claws like other birds. Young eagles attach themselves to the back of the mother eagle and are protected by the father eagle as they are carried up and taught to fly themselves. The metaphor speaks to the loving compassion and protection and strength of our Heavenly Father. How I brought you to myself speaks to both God's deliverance from Egypt and its purpose so God could commune in fellowship with his people. If you obey my voice and keep my commandment or covenant speaks to the requirement of the righteous and holy living, totally obedient to the Lord himself. A uh, kingdom of priests and a holy nation speaks to the role we play as believers in Jesus. This is not just for pastors and teachers. This is for all believers. Let's pick it up at verse 7. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and they laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded them. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I have come 
to you in the thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Now that phrase, that the people may hear when I speak to you and believe, is consistent theme with the Lord. He wants a direct relationship with his people. Let's pick it up in verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, and you shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base, for whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So the concept of consecration, consecration is like being set apart or made holy to the Lord. And being in a state of readiness for the Lord to present himself was the goal here. The Lord made it clear that anyone who attempted to go up on the mountain or touch his base shall die. The boundaries, the archers, and the stone slingers were in place to secure Mount Sinai. This speaks to those who attempt to gain entrance into heaven without accessing it via the door, who is the Christ. Listen, Jesus is the only way to the Father. Let's pick it up at verse 14. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. The concept of being ready for the third day is a heads-up passage for believers living at the time of the rapture. I believe that an event like a bump is going to occur just prior to the rapture that will signal the immediate season of the Lord's return. The coronavirus could be very well this bump. The riots that we're seeing in the street that could very well be this bump. It might be an earthquake or some other major event that happens that could be the bump. But listen, God allows this to wake us up to the reality of his soon return. There are many other signs that God has given to us which reveal a soon return to the earth. All we have to do is to look for them. And this would explain why Jesus said that um, we would not know the day or the hour, but he did say that we would know the season when he is near, even at the very doors. That's Matthew 24, 33 through 36. Let's pick it up in uh, verse 17 and following. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Watch this. And Moses went up. This is a picture of the rapture, if there ever was one. Many Bible scholars agree that the principles that are presented in the Sinai event speak to God's desire to call holy people to himself. The Bible says that our God is a consuming fire, and his presence on Sinai was in the fire. The blast of the trumpet sounded long and louder as God's voice was heard in the midst. God's presence was manifested on the mountain. Then God called Moses up, and he went. See, what Moses experienced that day is something that you and I will experience in the rapture. We have been made holy by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus. What happened in Egypt on the night of Passover and the Exodus will happen again to America and to the world at the rapture. The Lord is returning for us very soon, and we will be going up to be with him. All those who are left behind will experience the same fate as the Egyptians who suffer the ten plagues, the loss of their firstborn, the loss of their national army, their pharaoh, that's their president or leader, and their prominent place in world history. And while it's true that we really don't care what happens to America and the world after we're gone per se, it's equally true that we do care about the people who are in the world, mainly our unsaved family and loved ones and friends. And it's for this reason that we are producing these eschatology videos so that you and they will be informed when the time comes 
for an alleged UFO invasion or when multiple WNDs are deployed from enemy nations or when volcanoes and earthquakes cause major tsunamis with spatial anomalies like asteroids and meteors hit the earth all simultaneously to the event that is the rapture which will mask the global disappearances. Clearly, this will be like the exodus of Egypt. So the focus of the study was to compare the exodus of Egypt with the global exodus of the earth via the rapture of the church and the attendant impact it will have on the world. I hope you enjoyed this study. I know it was kind of long and I just wanted to do my best to be able to articulate the similarities of impact and I do my best to keep these videos moving and uh, make them interesting. So this is Pastor Rob signing off, telling you Maranatha. God bless you. We'll see you on the next one. Bye.